In this first session, we're going to pick up Mark chapter 13, verse 34. He gave authority to his servants. So it's the story that Jesus told, and it's in the context of the end of the world or the second coming. And here's the, here's the context. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge. Or the Greek, more literally, is he gave his servants authority, each with their assigned work and tells the one at the door, to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So that's Mark 13, 32 to 37. So the passage begins with the recognition of the open-ended quality of end time living. It's not necessary to make any predictions or forward planning. In fact, that's counterproductive because it distracts us from our role in doing life. And that role is emphasized in a few terse imperatives. Be on your guard. Be alert. Watch. Watch. And the reason for maintaining watchfulness has already been given because no one knows the time of the master's return. But there's and another element in play here, it's a sense of awareness about what God is doing. Do you remember, I often refer to the phrase in 1 Chronicles 12.32, the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. So Jesus is calling his disciples to pay attention to the signs of the times, not to slip into the sleep of complacency and become lazy servants. There's something to do. And this leads into a discussion of what it is to do. What, what is the right kind of behavior? How should the servants act? And in a surprising phrase, Jesus describes it as authority, as being in charge. And that's the Greek word exousian, which is translated authority. And it's surprising because that is a word that's not really part of the parable nor part of the normal everyday characteristics of a servant so it's the opposite and also it emerges from a long a big context of service and humility and a repudiation of what worldly success looks like you're not like the people of the world, they long to, the, you, it is not so among you, the Gentiles rule over one another. He's thinking specifically about the, the Romans and the Roman authority structure. Not so among you. The greatest is the least, the first, will, the, the last will be first, the child in the midst. You know, all these ways he's saying it's the opposite. It's the opposite of what in chargeness looks like. So there's an inescapable conclusion. Jesus is assigning roles to the church. He leaves his house, this church. He puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. But don't be too quick to assume that what he meant by church is the same as our experience of it. They were assigned tasks, the one at the door operating on the special duty of watch. But... The driving principle is very, very clear. The given authority to do things commanded by the master. So it's worth considering just what that authority looks like. Before we start enumerating the things that come under the authority of the believer, we have to acknowledge one basic truth that the believer is under authority one who is under authority. You remember the centurion coming to Jesus said, you know, just say the word and your servant, my servant is, is, is healed because I am a man under authority. I say to this one, go, he goes to this one, come, he comes. So he's saying, I'm under authority. So I understand how the structure of authority 
works right here. Exactly the same principle is being applied to believers. Jesus reminds us that we're servants and God is the authority. Jesus reminds us, you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, should say we are unworthy servants we've only done our duty now that's not a demeaning or delimiting or a, <laughs> a cringy kind of comment it's liberating and powerful we are not in charge of what we have to do we operate under authority we are filled with his spirit and impelled into his service we are commanded go into all the world we are commanded we are commanded we have tasks to do but believers always point to god's authority and the believer's life is one of total dependence on god amen as modeled by the son of man i only do the things i see the father doing i'm under authority but verses like Mark 13, 34, and Luke 10, 19, among others, are given to the followers of Jesus and speak of something more. This is Luke 19, I, uh, Luke 10, verse 19. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Wow. So that authority in the first place is commanding. It has a commanding quality about it. In Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So I need authority even over the words that I speak so that they may speak life and not death. And our authority operates from Jesus's authority. I'm not just trying harder with this business of keeping my words under control. I am, I am a man under authority in Jesus' name. Get a grip on my lip. Zip my lip. <laughs> and see Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth, all authority. And uh, thus, therefore, I send you men and women under authority. So it, it commands, it commands, it speaks a rule. Second, it operates in healing. In Matthew 10, verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Just as Jesus did in John chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus told the man, rise, take up your bed and walk this might sound new strange abrasive feisty <laughs> but these are the contexts in which authority is spoken about in the words of jesus and jesus says all authority has begun to me and therefore i send you be careful to obey everything i've said Matthew 28, right at the end, I am with you always. I am with you always. So it operates in a command. It operates in a word of healing, a declaration of healing. It operates in deliverance. And at the end of Mark's gospel, Mark 16, verse 17, it says, and these signs shall follow those who believe in my name, they will cast out devils, demons, just as Jesus did. Remember in the beginning stages of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 8, verse 16, when evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. With his word. With his word. Why? How? Because he spoke with authority, and all authority has been given to me, and I send 
you therefore, therefore, he gave his servants authority to command, to operate in healing, to operate in deliverance, to operate in the name of Jesus. This is such a key phrase, and we'll come back to it again. Authority operates in the name of Jesus. And Philippians chapter 2, 2 to 10, we'll just read a verse from it. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth. Got that basic three-tier universe system. It's like saying every it's a, it's a parabolic way of saying everywhere and everything in every condition, in every circumstance. And bowing the knee, knee means one thing. It means operating in authority. It means submission at the name of Jesus. And so when we pray and we say in Jesus' name, amen, maybe that's become a little ritualistic. Maybe it's become a bit of a, a thing that we say a rote, but it's there for a reason. It's there to declare this very truth that we operate in total dependency upon the Lord and we speak and work and operate in his name. And we'll go into this in great detail in, in the, um, particularly the book of Acts, the book of Acts. By what name, by what authority do you say these things? Okay. And Jesus attribute, uh, distributes his authority in Mark 13, 34, as we've seen through Jesus' name in Mark 16. And this is access through faith in Jesus. I believe, I believe in Jesus. He is my Lord. I believe in him. And in him, I have life. And he has taken authority over me. And in his name, I operate under his authority now. So the battle on, we live in a war zone. It might not always feel it. It might feel um, what a wonderful world. It might feel that we can sink back and float to heaven on rosy beds of ease. But we are in a, a war zone. And if we have encountered anything that's gone wrong or difficult, we've come against any grief or bereavement or circumstance that would threaten, we come to the point of needing to know his name in whose authority we live and speak. So there's a battle on, and my understanding of the authority in which I'm called to walk is probably the deciding point on whether I walk in victory or in defeat. Many people choose not to believe that, but whether they do or not, the fact is that it's taking place. And your unwillingness to engage in battle doesn't mean that the battle isn't raging. It just means that you're going to lose. But once you realize the battle is real, then you can learn to recognize what's going on and take the proper action to improve your situation. You can resist the devil. Finally, submit that yourselves therefore to God, humble yourselves, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. Let's stop at that point and pick up in the next session. May God bless you. And Lord, make this word real to our hearts, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.